Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, Young Blonde Suburban. I'm your host, Caitlin Files. I'm a young, white, female-identifying lawyer who lives in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, outside of Philly. This podcast runs as a sister show to Young Black Suburban, hosted by Tim Witherspoon Jr. The Young Suburban podcast hosts guests to engage in conversation about their different life journeys and perspectives. My show, Young Blonde, has a special focus on badass babes out there doing the damn thing. So welcome and thank you for tuning in. Let's jump into today's episode. Okay. All right. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Young Blonde Suburban podcast. I'm your host, Caitlin Files. And today with us, I have my cousin, Shelby Butts. Shelby, so happy to have you here. You say hi to everyone. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me, Kate. I'm really excited. I'm excited too. Um, We talk about some really fun stuff all the time and I'm excited to have you on here today to talk about that stuff together. But just by way of background, um, Young Blonde Suburban runs as a sister podcast to Young Black Suburban. So if you guys haven't listened to that yet, you should go listen. Host is Tim Witherspoon Jr. Um, And he basically um, push me to start this podcast. He has diverse guests on his show and they just talk about all the things. And that's what we're doing on Young Blonde Suburban. Special focus on badass babes doing it, especially like you, Shelby. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm super happy to have you here today. Um, so why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about yourself? Where are you from? Yeah. So I'm from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Uh, northeastern corner just north of the Pocono Mountains grew up here lived here till about 18 and then moved away for college Uh, I went down to Coastal Carolina University which is right outside of Myrtle Beach it's in a small town called Conway Um, a lot of people forget that Conway is its own thing away from Myrtle Beach so I like to point that out that it's actually in Conway South Carolina (laughs) go Conway Um, so uh, why did I go there I went there because I got recruited for soccer Uh, I love soccer. I played my whole life and never really honestly thought that I could go to college for it. My dad would always tell me that I didn't have the spark or the drive to play. And Kate, actually, he would compare me to you guys all the time, how your dad would have you like basketball all the time and all of those camps. And you guys would be doing runs at the beach and workouts. And I would not mind me. PTSD. (laughs) But yeah, but I just, I didn't have that drive immediately. And then I think it was about junior year. I really decided that I wanted to play soccer and it was kind of too late, but I contacted the coastal Carolina university head coach and sent him my tapes and basically said, this is why you want me on your team. And he uh, watched my tapes. He sent a recruiter up, saw me play and offered me a scholarship. So kind of start right on this story. I don't think a lot of people know how I got there. That's amazing. Cause I was going to ask you about, cause growing up in Wilkes-Barre, I mean, Wilkes-Barre is what, like two and a half to three hours outside of Philly. Yeah. It's about, yeah. About two and a half. Yeah. So you guys are a decent way. I mean, like Bucks is only 30 minutes. So we're mm-hmm. in and out of the city. You guys are pretty a decent way out heading towards it's what'd you say? It's Northwestern. Northeastern. Yeah. Northeastern. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you were definitely way more removed from the city than I was. Um, and you kind of broke the mold going way down south. away because you yeah. have older sisters who went to college local yeah stayed. pa state schools mm-hmm. they got married and are currently still living in pennsylvania correct yeah yep okay. um but you did not do that you no, <laughs> i didn't and i actively tried to <laughs> to leave i found people to tell me <laughs> to leave um yeah it was, it was different. Um, who told you to leave? Honestly, my dad. Okay. Um, yeah. And not that he like said, get out. I don't want you here, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, like, uh, my dad, he, my parents, both of them are phenomenal as you know. Um, but when we time. started, <laughs> when they, when we started to get to that age of trying to figure out what we wanted to do, they just asked us flat out, what do you like doing? And my oldest sister, Christina, she loves staying in hotels. And that's what she said. She's like, I want to live in hotels and order room service. So she went into hotel restaurant management. And now she's this really cool, big event wedding planner. Um, Ashley was a little bit different. She didn't know what she really wanted to do. So she tried a whole bunch of things. But for myself, I loved the ocean and I loved the beach and I loved visiting it and learning it. And when everybody else would squirm from things touching them, I had a pair of goggles and diving down to figure out what it was. 
So we Googled some things and figured out what I could do with that desire and that passion. And it was marine science. So my dad and I, my mom, we found a college fair um, in Montage Mountain, which is just here in wilkes Bear, And we went and found Coastal Carolina University. And they talked to me about the marine science program, how it was top five within the um, U.S. on the East Coast for marine science and how they had hands-on learning from day one and they had their own island and they had this connection with um, different research labs and how I could really get ahead of things that I couldn't do by staying in Pennsylvania. And then around that time, that was about sophomore year. And then junior year, I made the connection of I could play soccer. And I, as I said, I sent the tapes out and it just kind of all lined up. And I thought about not going, to be honest. I got a little scared because like you said, my sisters stayed here. All of our cousins stayed here. All my friends, either we, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, half of my graduating class were going to Temple, half were going to Penn State. There was about two of us that didn't do that. And I, I was scared. I, I was really nervous. Um, but I just decided if, if that's what I wanted to do, that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be a scientist and to be a marine scientist, the best place for me was going to be on a beach learning what I wanted to learn. So I went. <laughs> I mean, you did really break the mold though. It was, and it's not something when we were growing up, I mean, no one ever like really had conversations about this with us about like mm -mm. going after what you want and dreams. And you brought up your parents and I always attribute everything I have and my desire, my passion for anything that it's what my parents instilled in me. And they pushed me to just go get it if you want it. Um, but we didn't, I don't remember actively having big conversations like that. Like you can do anything you want. Like, I don't remember those conversations. <laughs> I don't remember us talking about them as cousins growing up. Um, no. But then it's cool as adults to kind of be like, oh, we kind of just went out there. Did, did that. Did that. <laughs> yeah. And, and honestly, you really did. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I reflect back on that and from talking to you and other people and a lot of people in the fellowship that I just finished had uh, either similar or total opposite stories where they just kind of stayed home and, and ended up where they are. But a couple other girls also broke the mold, went out far away from home. My current roommate uh, lived in Colorado, originally went to Syracuse for school and then ended up in DC where we are now. Um, and just talking to her about it. And we both expressed that it's, it, it wasn't like, like you said, like a sit down, you could do anything you want to do, put your mind to it. But it was kind of the subtle things of that with our parents um, in school of you can, you can do your math homework if you put your mind to it. You can make that three point shot if you work hard enough and get there. So it was more of like these subtle things. And then really when I wanted to leave, that's when my parents really had that conversation. And I, I'll, my mom said it perfectly. She said, told me, Shelby, you can have roots and wings. You can root in, stay home always, but you can fly away and leave and just come back to those roots. And, and we're not going anywhere. We're always going to be your family. And I think that was one of my biggest fears was, you know, out of sight, out of mind, you leave and you, you, you get forgotten, um, but never, absolutely never. And that's my big saying now, roots and wings, keep, keep what you hold dear, but explore. She is so beautiful. I love her so Isn't much. Isn't she amazing? She is amazing. Everything Annie. Knows. Annie is the best. I mean, I took my confirmation name after her. Like I You did. Her. Oh, yes, I did. She I love her. that. <laughs> well, we always said that you were the one that should have been in our family because you're blonde. I, I do. I look like I'm a sister. Us. Um, <laughs> I don't look like my sisters. I look like you guys. Yep. <laughs> um, fine with me. It's cool. It's also, fine by me. <laughs> but it is true. Having that like support system at home is so important for kids. And I think it's one of the things I, I was at my um, high school alma mater the other day, and it was a women's symposium about I don't know, teaching female empowerment and whatnot. And um, one of the things was the, one of the girls, the high school students asked about um, what, what you wish you had known when you were younger. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was like, I'll go first. I know immediately what I want to say. Like, you're going to be so scared. You're going to be scared doing everything and mm -hmm. like, okay, just do it. Just go out and do it and try new things. And I think it's from watching, especially you, Shelby, you really went out and went after stuff that was so different than anything anyone was doing. You went and played college sport. I don't think anyone in our family had done that. You went down to a school far away. I mean, I went to tell nerding, but my siblings were there. Like I went to family. I, it's not like I went <laughs> crazy. 
So you went to school far yeah. and then you're pursuing this really cool career that again is so different than anything any of us are doing. It's so cool. You're so cool. So I want to talk <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about um the sports though cuz I think that's yep. interesting your dad said that because I was thinking that where you kind of got your drive was I think girls who play sports um growing mm-hmm. up do develop more of a drive um because sports are pretty equalized when you're younger they're not yeah. professionally but when you're younger you know my basketball team was more important to my dad than my brother's basketball team um yeah yeah you Chevron. know that of course you guys were <laughs> down to we were good <laughs> But those are the things my dad would say. He's like, well, you're not Caitlin. You know, you're not, you're not going to Florida for tournaments. And I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. But I mean, I still like it. <laughs> <laughs> but so what, what was it about soccer that you really loved? Uh, initially, like innately, I think I'm just a, uh, attention, uh, I don't want to say ADD cause that's not correct. And I don't want to discredit that community, but Cause I'm not diagnosed with it, but I definitely have an attention span where I get bored pretty quickly and I need to be active. I need to be moving to be doing things with soccer. You're constantly moving, constantly thinking where like with softball, I was, it was more of a sit, stand, hit, run, sit, stand, you know, soccer, you were constantly moving. So I think that was initially what attracted me to it. Was it depleted my energy stores of, of, I was exhausted when I was done and I really felt accomplished. And then second, it was that team camaraderie. You really can't move the ball down the field without a teammate. You, you, you can't dribble through 11 other people. You can't, you, you just can't. So I think it was that team growing up and how we grew up as cousins, everyone was so close and my sisters and just having that additional family. Those are the two things I think really drew me to soccer and then of course the competitiveness the always of being able to to (laughs) (laughs) being able to like beat someone down the field or take the ball off of them or or if you're lucky enough to meg them or or, you know those were the three things that I think really really drew me to soccer it also bettered me too because when I got to college it really taught me how to time manage and how to prioritize because being in a hard science and uh team it was you had practice three times a day but you also had class five times a day so Mm -hmm. getting the right amount of sleep and food and rest and studying and even socializing with friends on and off the team it was so I think the structure also was something that subconsciously I liked but didn't realize until later down the road I'm still, I'm still stuck on, see, I remember you growing up and I just thought you were like a little sporty spice. I'm, I'm shocked your dad said you didn't have the drive. Well, um, did, that, like, what did that motivate you to then be like, I'm going to show Oh, it you. made me so mad. I was <laughs> livid. And you know, like, and again, it's one of those things where like you look back and you don't see, like you said, like those big conversations of, mm-hmm. of whatnot. And they were there, they were hundred percent there, but I think I blocked them out because it was after every game I would ride home with him and we would go over game play. We would talk about what I did wrong, what I did right. Some days I was receptive. Some days I wasn't um, yeah. of what he had yeah. to say. You're a teenage sure. girl. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you're like, could you just stop talking? And other days you just get so disappointed in yourself because they're disappointed in you. And you're like, man, I know better. Um, but I don't think it, honestly, it wasn't until after college soccer that I, he said that to me that about the spark. So he never said that growing up. And I think that was really respectful and really wise of him because I think it would have either thrown me into crazy competitive. I'm never going to stop or just turned me completely off. He was really good with uh, how to handle me as a, as a kid. Right. Um, but it honestly, it was when I was going after grad school when I wanted it more than anything, when I knew I wanted to get into my master's and then eventually my PhD and I would just would not stop. I was a force to be reckoned with. And he looked at me and that's when he said, this is the spark I always tried to push into you with sports in high school. This is what I've always wanted to see from you. And then he even admitted, he said, I thought you were going to have it in sports, but I, now I realize your spark isn't sports. Your spark is the environment. And that just made my heart so full, you know, cause my spark Absolutely. is the environment. That's what I want to put all my energy into. I want to save the, save the environment. Um, but, but 
that's when he said that. And that's when it kind of all clicked to me. And then I thought, you know, well, if I would have put this amount of energy and commitment into my sports, not that I wasn't committed, not that I didn't put a lot of energy, but it was just like that little extra oomph of I'm going to go to the national team or, you know, something like that. Um, I just didn't have it. I was always, I think, subconsciously holding out for my career. Um, but he'd always say, you know, if you put this amount of energy in, you could have gone big. And we have that conversation all the time. And it's, but where would I be now? Yeah. Would I be in exercise science major? Would I be in a nurse? Would I be something other with humans? Because that was my niche pod of the team. Would I not have gone to the environment? Would I have not have gone to animal science? You know, so it, everything happens for a reason, but I was really grateful that he explained that to me more rather than saying, you know, you didn't have the drive, you know, it was just oh, yeah. differently placed. And so, as you said, so I thought he said it to you when you were in high school and I was like, that's the most detrimental thing. <laughs> 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 I can't believe he girl. wasn't completely off-roaded and deflated after that, yep. but you're right. He was respectable and kind of held it to himself mm -hmm. um, because saying that to a teenage girl would be horrible. Detrimental. Yeah. <laughs> you already I mean, have self-esteem issues uh, and then be told, you know, you can't yeah. do it would be. Right. Nice. But looking back, it was more of like a, and it was never a, you can't do it. I think he'd always get pressure with me because he knew I could. Yeah. And he'd be like, Shelby, you know better. You can do this. I've seen you do it. Have that. And it's actually really funny. There was this one fifth grade all-star basketball game that he always brings up. And we call it the Newport Drive because it was the Newport All-Stars game. And like him telling a story, <laughs> right? We were down by maybe like, and this sounds so lame that I'm talking about fifth grade basketball, but we were down by a couple points with, right? We had to win. My dad wanted to win. It was his hometown game and he was coaching in, in, in home, like it was in his hometown. And he really, really wanted to win. He, he really wanted that. And I felt that from him and I put my 120% into it. And he says that he's never seen me play a sport like that ever again. And <laughs> you peaked fifth grade. Fifth grade, I peaked. <laughs> but, but I played college soccer, so clearly I was doing something right. But, you know, like th th that's the drive that we then talk about that that Newport drive is what I have in my career and in my science and in my studies. And I don't think I took him saying when he did tell me I didn't have the drive in athletics or when he would tell me like little pieces in high school and middle school, I didn't take it as, you know, I'm not good enough or this, like, I'm not going to make it. It was more of a, the way he went about it. It was more of like a, I'm going to show you that I can do it, but I just don't think my maturity was there to connect of how to do it until I got later. And in, in, like I said, in science, it's, it's just so funny though. Cause like, I didn't, I got recruited to play basketball in college and I was like, hell no. Like my try, I did not have, it's funny he, he ever used me. Cause I was like, uh-uh, like I played basketball for fun. <laughs> that is, but that's kind of like, my dad wanted me to go on and play basketball in college. And I just can't imagine if I had put all of my energy into something that I was being told to like, do. This is cool. This is great. But I wasn't feeling it. Um, I mean, I had plenty of free time in college because I didn't play a sport, but I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. So I took various classes. Um, the girl I had on before you for a podcast, I just happened to go with a class uh, to a lecture for her with um, about law school. And that's how I ended up going to law school. I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, but I can't imagine, I feel like a lot of people do almost force passion or drive for something that they feel like yeah. they yeah, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of people like that. I think that's how a lot of athletes get burnt out really quickly. Absolutely. And my, yeah, and my dad and I talk about that a lot too, because, you know, he looks back and he thinks, did I, he asks, did I push you too hard? Did I make you do something you didn't want to do? Because on my, in college, in, in soccer, I got recruited by one coach and then he didn't get hired back on. And then we had a second coach and she was really tough. And there were some um, issues with her, between her and the university where she got let go. And then I had a third coach. So in three years, I had three different coaches. And that second coach, she came in and basically wanted to wipe out the whole team and then recruit her own. So she put us through a lot, like fitness tests and running and nutrition plans and calorie intake and outtake. And she lined us up and said by position. And she was like, you need to gain X amount. You need to lose X amount. If you want to pay, it was awful. It was, it was oh, talk, uh, talk about like a, a blow. Oh, <laughs> um, oh, did you and I want, all need therapists after that? Cause that's great. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so 
I wanted to quit. I, I want, I didn't want to play anymore after that. And it, cause it wasn't fun. And my thought process was if she doesn't want me here, then fine, I'll leave. I'll go do something better. But the, when I spoke to my dad and my mom and honestly, uncle Chuck helped me through a lot, our, um, fantastic human that he is of, he told me, if you want to quit, quit for you. Don't quit because she's making you quit. Don't let somebody else decide what you should do. So I stuck it out and I'm, I'm so glad that I did. You did all four years. I did three. You did three years. So when did yeah. you, when did you not play? I did not play my senior year because in between my junior and senior year, I got an a uh, fantastic offer for an internship in Costa Rica for the summer working with sea turtles. And it was go to that coolest thing, go to that and miss pre uh, preseason and conditioning and not like, and wouldn't be able to play or go to South Carolina for three months and kill yourself with soccer and running and not go to Costa Rica and advance your career. So that was the very first science before sports or like social that I made. And that's huge. Cause I don't know if a lot of huge. kids that age would have made that decision. I think a lot of kids would have stuck with soccer and finished up mm-hmm. two years. I think it had a lot to do with the three coaches though, too. I was really yeah. burnt out at that point of, I haven't had a consistency in soccer, but I had a consistency in science. I think it was that. And then also what we were talking about before my spark, I had found my spark. My yeah. spark was science. I was never happier than I was in that marsh with mud up to my knees with a bug net over my head, poking at snails. Like that was when I was the happiest. <laughs> and like, that's just so interesting because I mean, you're from Wilkes-Barre. There's not any crazy, beautiful, I mean, there's waterfalls and stuff. It's Pennsylvania. It's lovely for hiking, but you're, I mean, you are, you went down to South Carolina and have not come back. Well, you're kind of back now. We will go get to that in a minute. But where did that, like, <laughs> the just like the love for the environment come from? The, I don't know, honestly. <laughs> I, we grew up going camping and mom would always take us for walks in the woods. And then as I got older, I talked to my mom about it more. And she's always had just this innate love for nature. And she says that she's the happiest when she's just walking around in the woods. Um, and so the we, sea. you love the sea, right? You're, I do love the sea. Yes. Yeah. So I love all nature. Absolutely. But when she would express that, I think that's where like the innateness of it comes from, mm-hmm. but just going to the beach all the time. And just, I think it's more of the curiosity in me of every time I go to the beach, I find something new. Every time I go to the beach, I learn something new where I think, okay, there's the, the you know, those little sand crabs are called mole crabs, ones that bury under the yeah. sand. And they, they're, they're the cutest little things. I would not agree <laughs> that they're the cutest little things, but I'm, I understand that you think they're cute. <laughs> but like growing, growing up and seeing them thinking at, at that like young age of how do you breathe under sand? Is there air down there? And when the water comes in, how do you continue to breathe? Like these were the thoughts that I had mm-hmm. as a child. Um, or when Ashley would scream because CB touched her in a lake. I would run down and grab it and be like, Ashley, this is what was touching you. She's like, I don't care. I'm like, but look at it. It's like, it's slimy. It's this, it's that. And that, I I don't know where that came from. I've just always been curious about the things that I didn't know and I couldn't see. And I think just the beach had so many of those that I wanted, I just wanted to know. And then I think another pivotal thing was when my mom got sick in, when I was in middle school, um, that's when I, that was right around the time where I started thinking I really loved the ocean. And I was thinking about ocean things all the time and just memorizing random ocean facts. And she got sick and I was just somehow clung on to the idea of deep sea creatures having the cure to cancer. If they're that deep, that pressurized, they can't see, they have all these different special sensory organs on them and ways to survive down there how do they not have the cure for cancer how do they not have something that we know that we can bring up here and help humans and I think that was the first connection whether it's real or not but in my head at least of how how we are all connected and I think that was the moment where subconsciously I thought this is what I want to do and then that's really weird because to to think about now, because then that's exactly what I did. I went into marine science and then I went into environmental human health to tie marine science to humans to then better it for everybody and just kind of co-inhabitate 
love for all type of feelings. <laughs> so it was like kind of a mix of like your curious nature, which is amazing you pursued. Cause I think a lot of people get curious about stuff, but then just fall into a job, you know, they don't yeah. pursue their passion and you kind of mix it with an emotional side of things um, to really drive you forward. And I mean, you I like you're, I follow everything you do because you're <laughs> really, <laughs> I can tell you every one of your Instagram stories the last five years, but you do <laughs> post so much knowledgeable stuff about the environment and you clearly care so much. That makes me care. Like maybe stuff I wouldn't have cared about before. I do. I love the environment. I yes. care, but you like, but that's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah. But you like really do a good job of explaining to people like why it's important and you can just I mean remember the year in Christmas when I cheated on Pollyanna so I could get you so I could give you all <laughs> you adopted me a polar bear <laughs> I adopted a polar bear for you yeah I still have the bear and the certificate and like a little plastic uh sheet and a binder it's just chilling there <laughs> I but it was because I mean I just loved watching you grow up and get so passionate about something that was so awesome um that I wanted to like recognize it and be like yes girl keep going I love thank it. you it, it meant so much honestly because sometimes when I'm always the one saying oh like bring your tote bag or oh here use this bamboo straw or like I have I don't have my bag on me right now but I legit have a little pouch of uh bamboo forks bamboo spoons bamboo knives straws um, reusable tissue, which people think is really gross, but it's just mine. So no one else is going to use it. You do but use. Like, right. All of these things. And sometimes now I, we talked about this yesterday of just not caring anymore of what someone thinks of me. And I used to be really like shy when I brought my straw out. Now I'm, I pull out five and I'm like, who wants one? You know, like let's, let's all do mm -hmm. our little part that we can help with and just trying to do little things like that and just not caring anymore who who says what you know because if you don't care oh, I, I just kind of sometimes snap back oh you don't care about the environment <laughs> but it's true it's like you have to learn to be unapologetic about things that mm -hmm. you shouldn't be apologizing for we were talking last night about the things that women have to go through um you know we were talking about being in stairwells alone and yes out and crossing the street and i don't like when i'm in an elevator alone with a man because i it just freaks me out and mm -hmm. like i would never have said that probably a couple of years ago and now i'm like no oh, i'm, I'm just <laughs> and you know, the other, <laughs> yeah and the other thing that i've noticed too is so i just got out of the canal fellowship which is a, a marine science policy fellowship with the federal agencies like NOAA, epa sea grant and there's a group of people in it and through different resources that we all share and whatnot we've realized that the way that even just females email is so different than the way that males email I love watching and, TikToks of that. <laughs> yes and I think it was a TikTok where it was like okay let me write an email like a male would and it was just thanks this is wrong please fix period and they can please, send please it out. please wasn't included please was you're right please wasn't <laughs> even in there. points no please fix by end of day <laughs> but you know exactly what I'm talking about and yep. I this month I've consciously made it an effort to be more direct in my emails. And I still press send with some anxiety of thinking who's going to take it what way. And, and does it mean it like this? And you, you just, you just, you just got to go for it. You just, you have to stop apologizing. And like, how many times a day do you say, I'm sorry? <laughs> right. I think I said, I'm sorry to like a chair that I ran into the other day. Like why, why, why is that an innate thing for us? <laughs> it, 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 you do you are apologizing for things and it's true. I mean, there's just certain things that you feel like you have to change the way. I am like a very vibrant person. <laughs> I put exclamation points and things. Oh, yes. That's just how I talk. Emojis. I, yes. Oh, I love yes. emoji. But <laughs> like in the lawyer world, that's tough oh, to do. Yeah. To pull off. But when I opened my own firm, I was like, I can't try to fit into a role a mold that, yeah and you know they're almost all the firms I know actually all of the firms I know are white men who run the firm and I'm not I'm a young white girl but I I run things differently and when I started the firm I I was trying to fit that mold 
And I was like, mm-hmm. this isn't me. I'm not going to be able to have success if I can't just be myself and just be who I want to be with my clients. And yeah, um, it's funny the other day, a client heard me, my music like blaring in the background because the Bluetooth didn't turn on quickly enough. Oh, geez. Luckily it was just like CCR. So like he didn't care. Oh. He was like, oh, you're kind of cool. I was like, oh, thanks so much. <laughs> like you just <laughs> a little bit of me for a second. I also love jam bands. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but I think people appreciate that when you almost just kind of let go and are yourself. human. Yeah. Just being yourself. Yeah. I've realized that's the people that I connect with so much. So in my new job are the ones that just are real and they just want mm-hmm. to have that connection with you. It's not just a, I'm this role, you're that role. It's an, an actual connection, which is nice. And kind of like what you were talking about with the, with the law firm and fitting a mold is uh, something that I've talked to a couple of a couple of the other girls that are in PhD programs as well is conforming into that all PhDs are either jerks that know it all or they're very, um, and this is not my opinion, but very like non-social, unattractive people. And I think that's just so disgusting because I know some people who are, there, there are no moles. Like you can't even say I know some people who are X, Y, Z because there's so many PhDs that are one way and other ways and mix of ways, but that was- them hundred percent. And that was one thing that I realized when I got out of grad school, I had this fantastic mentor, Julie Harding. She still works down at Coastal Carolina University. She's researching at the field lab that I used to research at. She is a phenomenal human. And she sat me down and said, what do you want to do? And I, I didn't know. And she's like, do you want to do grad school? Do you want to like, I I said, I don't know. So she told me basically the base, the baseline of what I could do with the bachelor's, the baseline of what I could do with the master's and the baseline of what I could do with the PhD. And I realized I wanted a PhD like that. I wanted to do that, but I wasn't sure in what, so then she advised, well, maybe you should do a master's, figure it out a little bit more and then go in to a PhD. And she warned me, she was like, because you're a female going into this role, you may or may not be taken seriously. You're going to have to work harder than other people because one, you're blonde, no offense, but you're, really? there's stereotypes with blondes. She's like, you're a cute girl. So people are going to look at you and not think you're intelligent immediately. They're going to think, how did you get here? Clearly it's not because of your brains. And at the time I thought oh, that's that generation. There's no way that's going to happen. I've run into that. Oh, and it's, hell yeah. it's, it's, and you think, I don't know. I was, I think I was jaded in the beginning thinking like, Oh no, things have changed. It's not how it's going to be. Uh-huh. It's 100% how it is. Um, I'm fortunate enough that my field right now it's very lady driven, which is nice. And a lot of those stereotypes and a lot of those hurdles are being broken down by people above me, by people around me. Um, I'm trying to do it myself for other people coming up behind me. So it's, it's changing, but we're still running into it. But the one thing that I I think I mentioned this to you before is when I was in my PhD, I wanted, again, it's kind of similar to soccer in my second year, of my PhD, I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm far from home. I think it all weighed on me that one year. And you talk to any PhD student, they'll tell you the same. It's that two year slump. It's when you've gotten all of your classwork done, half of your research, you're sick of your research. You just want to be done. And it's either, it's the make or break moment. Either you drop out or you keep going. And the extra piece that weighed on me was I was away from home. I didn't have any support system around me. I had my good friends, but that's, it's not the same as your family or your sisters, or um, I didn't, I I had gone through a really big breakup at that time as well. So I I just really didn't have anybody. I felt very low and I just, I wanted to quit. I, I, I didn't want to be there. And my one mentor, Dr. Porter, he told me, Google who you want to be. Google positions, Google people, figure out what you want to do and, and look at their credentials. What have they done? Have they gone and gotten certificates? Have they gotten a degree? What, what have they done? And every role that I looked at where I wanted to be, it was a female PhD and a male master's. And that infuriated me. And I don't think it should have infuriated me as much as it did, but I was angry. And from yeah. that moment on, I said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to build a bridge and for myself, for other people, and I'm going to be in that next level and I'm going to make a difference. And that's honestly why I finished my PhD. And then as I went through it more, then I got the opportunity to go to Australia and live on my own for the year. And then I got to go to all these different conferences and uh, present my research. And that kind of reignited that science spark that I had again after that, that low moment. So it, it's a lot of, of things that, that, that mold you, I guess, is what I'm, I'm trying to say. 
Well, I think our generation is seeing um, like what you're saying, there's, a, there's still a lot of doors that are closed to women or at least partially shut. Mm -hmm. um, and it's driving. I mean, I just opened my, I never thought I would have opened my own law firm like ever, but but look at you. I, yeah, I was like, why can they do it? And I can't do it. That doesn't make any sense. And I looked around and no other, there's no other female firm in the workers' compensation field in Philadelphia, which is absurd because there are so wow. many firms and so many smart, intelligent, amazing women mm -hmm. that I see every day on a daily basis who are just not, they're just not doing it. Um, and they can be, but it's just not something we see. There are none, there's nothing to see. So I mm -hmm. think it's huge that you saw that and you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to go get it. <laughs> right. I'm going to go be that example for others. Yeah. And that's the thing that like we talk about. I mean, we grew up again, not ever talking about this stuff, but now mm -hmm. as adults, we like, are just sending <laughs> empowerment means back and forth to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, it's like what you said in the beginning of the, of this, this conversation was when you were at that, at your alma mater high school and they said, well, what do you wish that you knew? Uh, it's not even, what do you wish that you knew? It's what do you wish that you had? I wish I had someone that I could point to in her. I want to be her. I, I want that, you know? And I, I do feel like a lot of, uh, at least in when we were growing up in, and you can correct me if you think differently, but I think a lot of those examples were there in athletics. I think a lot of it was coming up with like Nia Hamm and mm -hmm. the WNBA. A lot of those yeah. examples were coming out, but not a lot in the career field. Nice. And I feel like we are those people. I feel like there's a lot of people. I had one of those moments the other day. Uh, my boyfriend, Taylor, is an accountant at a really big firm down in Carolina, and they have a bunch of clients. And the one I don't know if it was a client or, or somebody within the firm had said, was just talking casually. And they said, oh, you know, my daughter wants to go into environmental law and she doesn't know where to go or where to start. And she's really interested in the marine world with the oceans. And Taylor was like, oh, my girlfriend's a marine scientist. And the woman was like, oh, really? Like, what does she do? And then he like listed off the things that I've been doing and that now I'm working for the federal government. And she just lit up and she's like, can I have her phone number? Can I have her email? I want to connect her with my daughter. Like she really needs somebody. And I told Taylor, anybody that asks hundred percent, I nerd about the environment. I'm going to talk to anybody about it. Cause I love it so much. And he did. And this girl emailed me and like, I'm just, I'm haven't replied, haven't had talked to her yet, but I'm just so excited to be able to talk to her and be like, you can do it, go do it. Here are things that I wish I would have known. Here are resources, here are, because even now, like as I'm going through, through now being an adult, which is weird to think, of hearing of all the opportunities that I did miss out on because I didn't have somebody that had done it before, I just putting those away in my pocket to then give to other people. And I think it's huge. I mean, I don't, I like always say this on career days, we only had men come in really and talk to us. Like mm -hmm. I don't remember any local female like leaders in anything. Mm -hmm. and I think that's something big with our generation. And I see it a lot in these women who are out there doing things is that they're trying to also show young girls that they can do it as well, which is yes. awesome because we didn't really have that. Um, yeah. I think yeah. it's funny. Shell. I think it's trying. <laughs> I love it. So we're like wrapping up here. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I want to ask you two things that, but to close off one, what okay. can we do to better help your environment, your environmental goes here? What do you want people to do? And to, oh, how long do you have? <laughs> no, one, one, what, what make thing? it easy um, for people. <laughs> make an easy change, make, make an easy everyday change, whether it is honestly using a tote bag, remembering to use a tote bag at least twice a week, whether it is using a paper straw, although it gets gross and disgusting at the bottom, invest in a bamboo straw. I bought reusable straws to keep at home for you. Yes. I love I'm that. I'm using one right now. <laughs> oh, right boom. Me too. Mine's silicone. It's sucking <laughs> that. I love it. All also, right, Marissa, what can you it? read this? Stop sucking. <laughs> the straw. <That's> <laughs> Um, it would just, it would just make the easy everyday change. It, it's, it's something that is not convenient, but it's easy to do. And even that one little change is going to make a difference. Okay. And the last question that we're going to wrap up every show with is what is something that brings you joy? Oh my gosh. <laughs> the ocean. I knew it. 
<laughs> whether it is just sticking my toes in or seeing a video of it there's this there's this live cam at the research lab that I used to work at in grad school um, and it's 24 7 camera GoPro there that you can log into and see what's going on and it's right at the research site where I used to collect my oysters so I legit check on my oysters once a day every morning I log in there's this blue heron that comes down check in on him it's it's honestly my daily like zen in the morning that is so cute i don't know if I've ever heard that. I <laughs> it's probably that. really nerdy <laughs> <laughs> good you're a marine scientist you got to be a cute little nerd yep Thanks. Well, thank you so much for being on this and giving us time today loved your insight into everything and i love how much you love the environment <laughs> thanks thanks i appreciate it thank you for having me this was fun and um yeah just keep being a ba yourself <laughs> <laughs> All right, girl. <laughs> okay. All right, we're here with Tim Witherspoon Jr., Young Black Suburban. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you for having me yet again. Two weeks in a row. That's it. It's very exciting. Same um, I know. It's, it's great, great stuff. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> <laughs> So this time we're talking about Shelby, yeah. who we just listened to, my cousin. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, Shelby seemed like a very uh, interesting guest, you know. Yeah. She uh, seemed like someone who found her passion uh, mm -hmm. a little later than some people. Not late, but I mean. I feel like she found it early. You think early? Well, I didn't know I was going to be a lawyer <laughs> until I was like well into college. From what I got from the podcast is that she was trying really hard with sports first. Yeah. Uh, and then um, her and her father used to have that to kind of bond to a little bit. Yeah. And then, you know, he realized that her passion wasn't really sports. It was the environment. Yeah. Um, and, and so to me, I mean, yeah, of course, like people say... Uh, I own a gym at a young age, so oh, I found out early. But, you know, you have a whole lifetime yeah. uh, of things that you've done until you find that passion. So I, that's kind of where I was coming from, where uh, she found her passion after, you know, sports. Didn't she yeah. play uh, college soccer? Yeah, yeah, she played which, college soccer. Right, right, right. Um, which, you know, to talk about her uh, sports and, and all that, um, I found it interesting that, um, her, like I said earlier, her and her dad really, uh, bonded off of that. And the reason why is because, um, my father was my coach. Yeah. Uh, and I know how hard, you know, parents can be on their kids when it comes to sports. Mm -hmm. Um, and for her to explain, uh, the time that her father actually said to her, um, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, this whole time, you know, I didn't realize that the environment was actually your right. passion. Uh, it kind of hit home. Uh, I haven't had that moment yet. <laughs> I, haven't had, I, I haven't had that moment yet. I, I want that moment, Shelby, if you can send me the tape. Uh, um, that'd be great. But uh, I really felt that one. I thought that that was great. Yeah, I think that like playing sports is something that Shelby and I related to when we were growing up. I'll never forget when she, so I went to Notre Dame and like we were big into football and everything. And she went to Coastal Carolina, which like wasn't that big into football. And none of our cousins went anywhere with like a big football school. And she went to University of South Carolina for grad school. And she went to her first football game. And I remember her calling me immediately after the game. and was like, I finally get it. I get why you're obsessed with these sports and I was like, yeah, it's so fun. It's like the communal aspect, mm -hmm. but it was something that we always connected with with sports. And like, she had that dad that was always there pushing her. So did I. And like, right. I think it helped us as like girls at a young age, just in self confidence Yeah, because girls playing sports. I mean, sports are so equal when you're younger, like girls and boys are kind of on the same yeah, page. Yeah, yeah. We used to play against the boys team all the time and didn't right. think twice of it. And it's not until you get to the more professional ones. Well, early on, most girls are better than boys. Oh, yeah. I as, used to be way better than my brother. Sports. And then yeah. he got bigger than me, and then that stopped. But, right. yeah, I mean, it is something I think girls playing sports growing yeah. up really helps and feel confidence. And I think in that them. it's important for uh, other females to hear 
how much sports uh, played a big part in your guys' life, but it wasn't everything, you know, after mm-hmm. sports, you guys um, both found careers and, you know, felt you got fulfillment uh, out of doing other things. Um, a lot of times, not just females, you know, everyone uh, puts a lot of stock into being this one thing, yeah. uh, thinking that that's going to be uh, it for the rest of their life. And then when it's over, they they get some kind of depression or it's good that, you know, you guys can tell a story of, you know, it was this sports, basketball, was this soccer, was this. Um, but then wait a minute, <laughs> uh, um, this kind of shiny object over here seems interesting. And you guys went and you actually excelled in those fields. So yeah. um, to be an example as women, especially because um what a lot of people don't know too is that after high school a lot of women don't even exercise anymore um you know that's a lot of people don't exercise yeah a lot of people period but especially women um and to to know that there's other women out there that still enjoy uh sports yeah um is a very very uh big thing yeah I love that thing about Shelby. So I didn't know. My favorite thing about talking with Shelby is I didn't know so many things she told me, even though she's my cousin. I've known her for so many years and we're pretty close. But I didn't know that she kind of set her mind on going to Coastal Carolina and then called the recruiter and was like, come recruit me to play soccer. And mm-hmm. he did. And then she went there and got a scout. Like that to wow. me was just like, you're awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. I know. Like who has their head on like that? Yeah. I wasn't yeah. doing that. Yeah, She must have been what, 17? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. like... It was just, I think she's so cool because it just wasn't something that really got done in that area or in our family. Like we didn't really have that like go get her. I'm going to go down to South Carolina and like play sports and follow my passion for the environment. Right. Shelby's cool. Well, I mean, a young blonde suburban. (laughs) Yeah. Another young blonde suburban. Yeah. 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 Um, you guys are killing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing it. Uh, um, but, you know, through the episode so far, also I do see a lot of humility and a lot of uh, understanding of uh, what it means to be a young blonde suburban. Yeah. And, the, the you know, the privilege that comes with it. So while people listen to these episodes... Um, Hopefully they, you know, get that out of it as well. You know, you guys um, aren't just some young blondes who uh, got into college and uh, all of a sudden have careers. You know, you guys along the way have uh, sympathized and and seen other people's uh, struggles as well. And and you're trying uh, your best to get that message out through these episodes. I hear them in it. Yeah. Uh, You know, and and not just... uh, a cause that maybe young black suburban might be for, but the environment. Yeah. Uh, and women, and I mean, the reason I had Shelby basically is because we've grown so much in learning more and experiencing more and talking about tough issues. I mean, when George Floyd happened, I've talked to her so much about ha- having hard conversations with family members and right. um, coming to terms with our own privilege and, she's very big on female empowerment like I am. And like, it's just something that we never talked about growing up, but we've both evolved into that person and can relate there. So that's why I did want to have Shelby because I think she does represent that really well. Right. It's crazy. Um, Another guest from an area that. (laughs) Yeah. Wilkes-Barre. That is not very, uh, I don't, I don't want to say not diverse, um, but I would, assume more rural. it's more you know, yeah. it's more rural uh, <laughs> who kind of gets it you know yeah she still gets it so um we can't be stereotyping people from you know a standpoint of where they're from mm-hmm. um it's all about you know people's willingness to be open in their experiences yeah uh and shelby explained that beautiful yeah she was a good guest yep well thanks for being here thanks for having me so yeah that's our episode for today and you should subscribe to the young suburban i'm gonna keep calling us a franchise sure all right young black and blonde <laughs> to